the greatest resources for understanding the human condition are the insights provided by the Greek philosophers and then the Christian philosophers from the patristic and medieval eras. To me, it's a bit unfortunate that over the past century, pop psychology has come to dominate our discussions of what make people tick. Uh, it's not that psychology hasn't provided valuable insights into the human condition, it has. But for my money, the depth of insight from Christian philosophers in the patristic and medieval eras is unparalleled. Now part of the difficulty in reading these early philosophers is that they used old style language in focusing their discussions on such subjects as prudence and temperance. These clearly aren't the modern, trendy topics you're likely to find in your local Christian bookstore. And it's perhaps natural for those of us in the modern world to ask, does the cultivation of prudence and temperance really represent the keys to our ability to make decisions day to day that lead to the good life? Well, I'd want to answer that question with an emphatic yes. I actually think that for most Christians today, prudence and temperance are perhaps the most critical determining factors <clears throat> in whether we make wise and godly decisions day in, day out. To see why that's so, consider a passage like the one from Matthew 8, where Jesus casts demons out of a possessed man and into a herd of pigs who then immediately race down a steep hill and drown in a lake. It's a unique and bizarre scene recorded in the Gospels. But I think one of the points of this bizarre passage is that we do get a clear, visible picture of the truth that whatever evil touches, it destroys. The nature of evil, the nature of sin is self-destruction. All enjoyments that come with sin have diminishing returns. The enjoyment gets less and less over time until the eventual outcome is self-destruction. That's just the nature of sin and evil. By contrast, we have the picture in the Gospels of Jesus, who is life itself. We find that Jesus is the bread of life. He's the resurrection and the life. He's life in every sense of the word. There is no long-term enjoyment or ever-increasing fullness of life that doesn't come through relationship with Him. That's who He is. That's just the nature of God. So on the one hand, we have the nature of God, which is life itself. And on the other hand, we have the nature of sin and evil, which is self-destruction. For Christians, it's that black and white. Now, in view of this clear dichotomy, I sometimes wonder how it is that I would ever sin. I mean, how does any Christian, knowing what we know about the nature of God and the nature of evil, how does any Christian ever sin? Well, earlier philosophers talked a lot about the phenomenon of weakness of will. Weakness of will refers to an occurrence where you know that, all things considered, it's in your own best interest to perform one action, and yet you choose to perform a different action. Weakness of will happens all the time. For example, if you've ever been flipping through the TV channels one last time before going to bed and come across some B-movie you've seen before, you know that, overall, it's in your best interest just to go to bed and get a good night's sleep so you can have a good next day but you end up watching the movie to the end, lamenting that fact when you finally do go to bed, and especially when the alarm clock wakes you up the next morning. I've done that. Why? Weakness of will. In a case like this, we're pursuing some lesser short-term enjoyment at the cost of what we recognize as a greater long-term enjoyment. For Christians, we know that our ultimate long-term well-being is best achieved only through God. But at times we choose to pursue lesser, shorter-term enjoyments, even while recognizing that these run counter to the pursuit of our greater long-term well-being. We succumb to weakness of will. Well, in response to the daily widespread phenomenon of weakness of will, the patristic and medieval Christian writers talked a lot about prudence and temperance. They understood prudence as a matter of not losing sight of the true value of things. 
keeping firmly in mind the relative value of short-term lesser goods and long-term greater goods, the relative reasons we have for pursuing each of these. And then they emphasized the cultivation of temperance, which involves pursuing things only to the degree they're valuable, running harder after the things of greater value, running less hard after the things of less value. If we as Christians do find that our poor choices typically are a matter of knowing that our overall best interest lies in obeying God, but still on occasion choosing to pursue an opposing short-term indulgence, then weakness of will really does become the cutting edge issue for us as we lead our lives. Accordingly, prudence and temperance become our remedy. Now, probably most Christians' prayer lives don't include regular prayers for prudence and temperance, but perhaps a central aspect of Christian growth really does hinge on the question, what spiritual disciplines help us cultivate prudence and temperance in our lives? This question may be something we continue to wrestle with, as we work out our faith over time, but the early Christian philosophers at least identified for us what the real cutting edge issue is in their discussion of the classic virtues of prudence and temperance. <laughs>